$1,020. Water is one of Australia's most precious commodities. 5900 sir, well bought to buy number 50. But with water prices at an all-time high, Australia's most extravagant water spending program is coming under fire. I would characterise it as pink bats for farmers or pink bats for earth movers. We're talking about billions in taxpayers' money on a scheme that many, many capable and reliable scientists have said this isn't going to work. The multi-billion dollar plan to save Australia's most threatened river system is being branded a failure and a farce by a growing band of critics. The Murray-Darling Basin plan is a trip and bottom line fail. It's failed for communities, it's failed for the economy and it's absolutely failed for the environment. It has been the biggest waste of $13 billion in the history of Australia's economy. We're degrading the rivers at the same time as we're handing out money to a few individuals to realise huge economic gains at public cost. It's almost worse than water theft because it's the government and taxpayer money that's being used to sanction this kind of behaviour. And that is a national scandal. Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate whether Australia's plan to rescue the Murray-Darling River system has become a colossal waste of taxpayer money and ask how multi-million dollar subsidies have been secretly handed to big business. In the town of Griffith, farmers are braving the bitter cold for the Riverina Field Day's showstopper event. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're only about five minutes away from starting the uh, Wilkes Water annual auction. It is a bit of a fresh day outside, so we are pleased to see such a good crowd. For the Hundreds are preparing for fierce competition at the annual public auction for water. Today isn't a boxing match, so no-one will fall out of the uh, ring and fall into the front row, so don't be afraid of the front row. I see the frosting. Look at, him. Look at his jacket. There's steam coming up. <laughs> the region is in drought and water is in high demand. We will have a few people on the phone, I think, also, so don't think they're running you up. They do Farmers like Julie Andreazza compete for water year-round against big corporations, investment banks and private traders. They're pushing the price of water up because they're not there to use that water for any purpose other than to gain profits. So they're in there to get the best price. They're like speculators. They're in there just buying and selling. They will sell to the highest bidder. Anyone can come in and buy water. You don't even have to be a farmer. You just need to be able to put it into a water account and have the money to pay for it. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to grow food with it or put it towards the environment. You're going to make money out of it. And that's what a lot of people are doing, unfortunately. 4350 to go there, 4350 or 300, 4300. The first lot's always the scariest. We need a starting bid. 4300 to go there, not overpriced at that. Bids are coming in from interstate and even overseas. I got two bid down to bid two's the offer. I got phone bid holds at 15 million. I got 15 in the ring. I bid 1,500 dollar bid down to bid 1,000, 1,600. Phone bid holds the money. 2,050 dollar bid down to bid 2,050, 1,050, 1,050. Now you're going to miss it for a pineapple. And a bid two. The sales are smashing records. I'm going to bowl. I got 7,000 dollar bid down to bid 7,000, 1,000. Got you. No good without it. I'll take a 50. I bid 7,000. Quick. Done it. 7,000. You miss it. Hold well on. 7,000 dollars to buy 24. Griffith in southwest New South Wales is at the centre of the most productive farming valley in Australia. The farms rely on a network of channels and pipes delivering water from the Murrumbidgee River. It was one of the, the first areas that was opened up as the food bowl of Australia. And a lot of the customers tell me all you need is a little bit of water and the soil's out here and, and you can grow anything. We have up to about 3,500 kilometres of channel systems within our, our main irrigation area. You know, that's a huge, huge network of uh, open channels and, and pipelines. 
traditional rice, wine and citrus has been the crops of the past. Now we're venturing into cotton, nuts like walnuts and almonds. They're corporatised. They are looking at the security of the area, especially water security, as the underpinning fact to come here. The Andreazes have been farming here for three generations and grow wheat for Arnott's Biscuits. Glenn and Julie Andreazza are the New South Wales Farmers of the Year, awarded for making every drop of water count. Not a drop leaves the farm anymore because we're so efficient and we're so careful with water. We used to call ourselves farmers. I think we're business people now. In the Murrumbidgee Valley, along Australia's fragile Murray-Darling River system, farming is more competitive than ever. Where there were probably ten farmers in an area, there might be five, because farmers who can't afford to stay in the business are having to sell out, either to their neighbours or to their friends or, or whoever's got the money to buy the land. So you might find one farmer owns four properties, whereas before you had four farmers with one property each. You can't survive on one farm. <laughs> Clear. Access to water has divided and enraged the community here since the introduction of a plan to save the Murray-Darling River system almost a decade ago. Governments couldn't give a shit about what happens to us people here. In 2010, the farmers of Griffith were at the centre of the furious backlash to the plan to recover water from them for the rivers. Julie and Glenn Andreazza were among thousands at a meeting with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority in Griffith. OK, up the back. Burn the plan! Burn the plan! To save the $13 billion plan from going up in smoke, farmers were given a sweetener. Irrigators were offered more than $5 billion in grants for infrastructure to reduce water going to waste on farms. The funds would pay for new irrigation systems, dams and earthworks, in return for farmers giving up a portion of their water rights. The government were looking for water. The government wanted to come and buy back water and uh, people who were not willing to just give up water as a buyback the carrot was dangled in that we could perform works and it just made it more palatable to people to do it. And um, people are going to do it. It, was, it. it is a lucrative thing. Ultimately, it was a big political call to get the Murray-Darling Basin plan over the line. In other words, if we were going to restore this system back to health and buy back water from irrigators, it had to be sold as a win-win. It has produced some real benefits for individual irrigators, big irrigators, some small irrigators, but it's been very expensive. So the taxpayers have had to fork out a lot more money to get water for the environment than they should have. David Papps was in charge of returning the water to the rivers, which was bought from farmers under the water infrastructure scheme. I certainly had quite strong concerns that perhaps the volumes of water that were being attributed to the environment were not always as accurate as they should have been. In other words, that the accounting system was lacking transparency and lacking rigour. And I think it's one of the long-term problems that need to be addressed in the basin. How extravagant would you say that this taxpayer spending scheme is? How extravagant is this scheme? I, extravagance, one word you could use, I'd just call it a rort. And I think I'm justified in calling it a rort or a scam because it still hasn't been disclosed to the public. What is the good, best available science behind this in terms of how much water we're getting out of these schemes? When we don't know what the science is in terms of how much water is actually being returned, the Andreazes were among the first in Griffith to apply for a subsidy. In return for giving up a portion of their water rights, they received more than $100,000 for earthworks to reduce water runoff from their farm. The value of the subsidy was about double the market price of the water. 
Those works were things that we were going to always do anyway. Obviously, cost was a problem, so we were going to do it down the track. But when this opportunity turned up for available funds to be used, well, of course, we jumped at it, so we did it. So the taxpayer was giving you money that you would have spent out of your pocket anyway? Yes, and it's certainly increased the assets on our farm as far as the infrastructure. We've got better, better land and, you know, better efficiency, but there's probably better ways that the government can spend that money to access water. So, I mean, this was billions of dollars available across Australia. People must have been saying, you beauty. Oh, well, a lot of people did, and uh, I guess they were using that as a bank, I suppose. So did the taxpayer pay value for money for the water here? I think the price for the water was overvalued, in my opinion. If you worked it properly, it worked very, very well. So for the, for the person doing the works, I think it was uh, a great benefit to them. But as far as a taxpayer, which I'm a taxpayer, I, I don't agree with the scheme. I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's actually um, too expensive. They later bought back the same volume of water that they'd surrendered for the grant and got it on the market at a lower price. Over time, they increased their water use to expand their business. But aren't we paying for you to save water? The fact is, if we want to continue farming, we then need to find more water to farm. So as much as we're giving up that water, we can be more efficient, but if, if we need to grow up more crops, we then need to go and buy more water. When you buy water back, it depends on what the market is at the time. So if water's at a low price, Glenn will jump in on the market and he'll, like, that's what everyone does now. It's become, water's become a marketable product. A lot of it has been a huge waste of taxpayer money. There is a lot of money we could have spent a lot more cost effectively to achieve a lot more recovery of environmental water. And then a lot of the expenditure that we have made has had a lot of unintended consequences. We've got some of the smartest, productive, most efficient farmers in the whole world. Um, and so when you get, when you subsidise irrigation infrastructure, you're creating incentives for change human behaviour. And some of that change behaviour means that they end up using more water. The infrastructure subsidies are so lucrative, they've encouraged people to buy unviable land and convert it into irrigated fields including earth mover John Kerrigan, whose business boomed as a result of the scheme. When the water efficiency projects came online, our business multiplied. We had one machine at the time. We were uh, up to 10 or 12 machines presently. If there's a problem with the scheme, it's that it was probably too enthusiastically rolled out uh, too much too quickly. Um, I would characterise it as pink bats for farmers or pink bats for earth movers. It all had to happen in a short space of time. The scheme provided John Kerrigan so much work, he bought an undeveloped property. He then got a grant himself of more than $200,000 for earthworks to irrigate his new land. The Commonwealth project funding accounted for about half of my spend on getting the property into a good irrigable shape. Taxpayers sitting at home might say, why am I giving a bloke $200,000 for a project to save water through farming when he actually isn't farming at all? He's not farming before, or not irrigating it before because it was un unfeasible to do so on that particular piece of real estate. The project efficiency schemes have allowed parts of farms throughout the district that previously were uneconomic to farm. They've been able to increase their arable area or their irrigable area uh, on farms. John Kerrigan didn't own any water to start with, so he bought some to give back to the government. He perfectly legally bought cheaper water from the Murray River even though his new farm is on the Murrumbidgee. Some irrigators are taking full advantage of the loose rules. They're buying cheaper water from another river and selling it to the government in exchange for projects on farms here. 
It means they're getting an even better deal from the already inflated price the government's been offering. Water's a lot cheaper in the Murray than it is in the Murrumbidgee, so it means that the irrigator is actually making a profit, quite a substantial profit, by buying Murray water to sell to the Commonwealth for a Murrumbidgee project. It also suggests that the project, which is there solely because it's supposed to generate savings in the Murrumbidgee, hasn't generated those savings, hence the irrigator's gone and bought Murray water instead. Aren't you using a subsidy for saving water in fact, in order to profit from using more water to farm. The concept or the, the purpose of doing that is to make something efficient and useful in that landscape and to generate more for me, of course, but also in the community. This happens all around the world, and this is something that economists said right at the beginning when these programs were being designed for water recovery purposes in the Murray-Darling Basin. And they're increasing their irrigation land area and they're increasing their water use over time. The scheme doesn't work. Its first problem is it's horrendously expensive compared to buying water licences. The evidence at the Royal Commission was at least 2.7 times more expensive to taxpayer. The implementation of the Basin Plan has been marred by maladministration. Richard Beasley was the senior counsel assisting the South Australian Royal Commission into the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. This year, it found the $4 billion spent so far on the water infrastructure scheme was wasteful and irresponsible. I would doubt whether there is any proper science behind these things. Uh, and that ought to be very closely investigated because we're not talking about grants of $100,000, even though they should be investigated. We're talking about billions in taxpayers' money on a scheme that many, many capable and reliable scientists have said, this isn't going to work. The grants have funded a wave of construction so farmers can store even more water in dams. Taxpayers financed this $300,000 dam for wealthy businessman Kelvin Baxter. We can get a big volume out of this into these irrigators. We can have the whole three irrigators running at once now we've got this somewhere. That's the idea. This dam can hold enough water to fill 200 Olympic swimming pools. But with the drought biting, water is scarce for Kel Baxter and his son Glenn. There's not a lot of water there, no. only about 50 megalitres, no. but yeah. this could hold 500 if we're ever able to fill it. Yeah, that's right. But yeah. It's been a dry 18 months. The dam completed a taxpayer-funded overhaul of the farm, including new spray irrigators, to reduce water waste and make it more productive. We're always going to do this, and I mean, we funded some of these through infrastructure, we funded some of them from our own means. Yes, we may have become more water use efficient because of these, that money being able to come a little bit quicker than we might have just done it out of profits, right, you know? So the scheme was paying for something you would have done anyway? In time, Correct. for sure. In time we would have done. Absolutely, yeah. yes. The water infrastructure scheme is changing the face of agriculture across the Murray-Darling Basin. It's fueling a transition to crops like almonds and walnuts, and their thirst for water is staggering. There's been an explosion in the production of nuts in the Murrumbidgee and more broadly in the Murray-Darling Basin. They're highly profitable crops. But they're permanent plantations, and by that I mean that they require water every year. They're not like rice or cotton, where if you don't have enough water because there's a drought, you simply don't plant the crop that year. Richard Kingsford has been studying the valley for more than 30 years. I've really seen agriculture change. These nut plantations, we know they require water, obviously, when they're growing, but they need a lot more water when they're mature, and they need water all the time. That's tremendous pressure, particularly if we hit a drought year and climate change really kicks in, um, which we haven't really planned for in the Murray-Darling. What are we going to do? What are politicians going to do? Governments are aware, ministers are aware of the dilemma they're facing and the potential consequences for both the environment and 
other irrigators in the basin. This may well be a time bomb. These mega farms belong to a company called Webster Limited, which produces 90% of Australia's walnuts and is part owned by Canadian pension fund PSP. Webster Limited is one of many big corporations expanding into the Murrumbidgee Valley. It's growing an empire here with the help of millions of dollars in water infrastructure grants. Webster's a corporate company. They've developed walnut plantations and almond plantations throughout the area. Their key driver, well I believe, is that they have sourced this area out because of its climate and because of its security with water. Water is the magnet that is bringing Webster to Griffith. You know, Webster owns large parcels and quantities of water, but it has sold massive, vast volumes of water to the federal government under the Basin Plan in northern New South Wales. And what it's done is use that money to come down here and buy further properties and more water. The landscape has changed at a, you know, a really rapid rate of knots. Anthony Kidman has watched Webster reshape the landscape with the help of the taxpayer since he started doing business with them as a project manager for the local water supplier Murrumbidgee Irrigation. In the last five years, it has been, it's exploded. On Webster's prize properties on the edge of the Murrumbidgee River, the company is transforming land the size of 40,000 rugby fields. When it was first brought into, into place, it was a livestock, uh, sheep and, and cattle. Webster is investing in another lucrative crop, cotton. It's absolutely enormous in terms of uh, the infrastructure that's been developed here. It's quite massive. Millions and millions of litres of water and millions and millions of dollars being spent in, in developing this land for this type of commodity. In recent months, Webster has levelled the fields and built channels. Along the river, we see a channel leading to a cotton field. You can see a development over to your right. They're creating a storage, significant size. You could say upwards of a thousand metres. Next to the cotton field, there's a new dam waiting to be filled. It's been funded by the taxpayer under the Water Infrastructure Scheme. That program was supposed to reduce the amount of water that was going to irrigation when it's actually increased the opportunities for irrigation, all subsidised by taxpayers. And worse, I think Australian taxpayers will be really shocked to find out that that money is actually going to foreign investors as well. And that's just absolutely perverse. Four Corners can reveal Webster Limited has received more than $40 million under the Water Infrastructure Scheme to help pay for a $78 million transformation of its properties. Webster's shareholders and Canadian backers are also banking on the funds for an expansion to the outer reaches of the Murrumbidgee to trap water that would have flowed into the rest of the Murray-Darling Basin. Along that road, you just see dam after dam after dam, these massive on-farm dams um, in a place that is as flat as a table um, that just should not have dams. Former Murray-Darling Basin Authority Director Mary Ann Slattery is investigating the impact of new dams on the river system. The way that valley is being changed and shaped from this program is just horrifying. It's really hard to believe you know, until you do that drive the scale of all these on-farm dams. And then when you realise they're being paid for by the Commonwealth under a supposedly environmental program, it's just horrifying. Near Hay, where the heat soars into the 40s, Webster is planning to build new dams to hold huge volumes of water that would have previously flowed past its properties. 
The water will be used to develop prime irrigated cotton country. What's the argument for taxpayers funding these massive new dams to save water? I can't really get that. Essentially, it increases the take from the river system and ultimately decreases the amount of water in the river, both for you know, the environmental systems downstream, but also the people that depend on that water downstream. That, to me, is where, in fact, we may be seeing more water taken out of these rivers rather than a water savings. As a taxpayer, it's absolutely outrageous and indefensible that Commonwealth funds for an environmental program are being used to fund big new dams to take flows that used to benefit the environment. The point of the subsidy is to save water and return that to the river system. It's not to allow the beneficiary to take more water. And in fact, it's so perverse, to my mind, it's almost worse than water theft because it's the government and taxpayer money that's being used to sanction this kind of behaviour. Despite more than $40 million granted to Webster Limited, its deals with the Australian government are confidential. There's no transparency about how the money's been spent or what effect Webster's huge irrigation expansion will have on the river system. Webster says it's acted at all times within the government's guidelines and that the projects have been independently audited. I'd want to see every invoice. I'm not suggesting there's anything untoward. I'd also be wanting to understand the science of how much water that scheme is saving the environment. The rules seem pretty slack, particularly in terms of the scientific justification for it. The efficiency program has become a massive subsidy for large agribusiness that has facilitated the increase of irrigation water, um, not a decrease. Look, I found it astounding. I mean, why are we building these large dams for private gain at public cost? I mean, how can we be doing that? And worse, you know, we're denying the river of the water that it needs, and it seems to be at complete odds with the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and the Water Act. In New South Wales, the biggest portion of water infrastructure funding has gone to one monopoly corporation, Murrumbidgee Irrigation, for upgrades to its huge network of channels and pipes which deliver water to the valley's farms. It's investing in the basin, it's getting water back for the environment, and it's actually also then upgrading our infrastructure. Murrumbidgee Irrigation has never had an opportunity like this before, I take it. It's a bit of a unique opportunity, yes, and the key thing for us is that we, we do have a period of time where we, we can really set, set this area up for the next 50 years and ensure that the, the productivity uh, and the, the agricultural production in the area continues to, to do well. Murrumbidgee Irrigation is also a major water trader in the region. They are a corporation entity or a company, but their shareholders are actually the farmers or agriculturalists in the Murrumbidgee irrigation area. Instead of them focusing on their customer and the products that those customers grow, they're focusing on whatever way they can make money for their own entity to continue to feed and thrive that entity. And I believe that that entity has grown into a monstrosity due to the massive influx of government coffers. So you're moving from a system that was fully manually operated? Tony Onley is a former Webster manager, now with Murrumbidgee Irrigation. As its business development coordinator, his job's been to consult with customers on how to spend the taxpayers' money. This is our big cotton growing area down here. Murrumbidgee Irrigation is using the infrastructure subsidies it's received to help improve the water supply on channels like this. 
yeah, we've got quite a considerable capacity increase. And so this uh, was through the taxpayer-funded program as uh, well? Yes, this, this was done under PIOP. OK, and it allows more water to come through? It does. Despite the aim of saving water, the infrastructure subsidies are driving up demand from customers like Webster. And do you maintain your contact uh, with the company? I maintain my, my contact with all of the customers that um, I come into contact with. OK. Some landholders uh, might say that that gives them a competitive advantage. Well, it doesn't. So, um, they're one of, our, one of 2,300 customers. They're a very important customer. But we treat all our customers equally. Is there a conflict of interest? Um, that's for someone else to answer. But from my point of view, absolutely not. The Australian Government funds our water savings initiatives and then we leverage off that in terms of other opportunities. If we're going into an area to do works, it does make sense to maximise the return on the works that you are doing. Some of your landholders complain that the bigger operators here are winning the benefits of the taxpayer funding, including Webster Limited. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that? I think the, all of the works that we're doing is benefiting all of our customers. Uh, the key aspect of, of what we do is provide water to all of our customers and all of our customers are our shareholders. And the, the investment in our infrastructure is actually providing a better level of service for, for each and, and every customer. Murrumbidgee Irrigation has used the water infrastructure funds to help transform the valley. Some customers have done better than others. On the dry hay plains on the outer reaches of the valley, Murrumbidgee Irrigation has removed an entire district of shareholders from its network of channels. The fact that we're being exited from their area of operation makes you wonder, is it a really a, a water savings project or is it a project where someone's making a um, substantial amount of money out of it. To save water, Murrumbidgee Irrigation shut down hundreds of kilometres of leaky channels. It means the regular water supply these farmers rely on now comes from a pipeline. Well, I've had to move all the cattle out of this paddock as I'm running out of water. As you can see from that dam there, there's turtles and animals and fish perishing there now. Fifth generation grazier Matt Ierson says the new pipeline supplies far less water than his business was built on. So this is our um, future water supply if we... Murrumbidgee Irrigation spent 49 million taxpayer dollars on the project and says billions of litres of water have been saved. The purpose of the scheme is for water savings. We support the water savings initiative and to save the losses along the channels. Couldn't agree more, but the process uh, has not been transparent at all, um, for the, especially for the taxpayer. They're, they've ha handed over all these millions of dollars for a scheme uh, that's supposed to have value for money. This is a fundamental project that has changed that landscape from a you know, unsustainable water delivery that to deliver two billion litres of water took 12. And there's now a full pipeline system of better quality water being delivered 365 days a year. The project allowed Murrumbidgee Irrigation to sell access to more water upstream, according to its former engineer, Anthony Kidman, who ran the project. That has given Murrumbidgee Irrigation a great ability or an extended ability to take the water capacity that was delivered to those customers in the past and share it or issue it to customers upstream. It is a golden opportunity to sell access to water delivery to some large customers, be it corporate or just large farmer customers. 
If you don't measure something, then you can't have accountability. Professor Quentin Grafton is the Chair of Water Economics at UNESCO. He's been warning for years that the government has grossly exaggerated the amount of water returned to the rivers under the water infrastructure scheme. And in the best case scenario, it's less than half of what the government claims. And in the worst case scenario, we've gone backwards, not forwards. That in fact, the amount of water in the environment has actually in fact declined as a result of these uh, efficiency subsidies and not gone forward. Uh, and that could be, could be, could be uh, backwards by, by more than 100 billion litres. We don't know. And we don't know because we need a water audit, a hydrological audit of what's going on in the basin. Studies have shown for decades that reducing wastewater on fields means less seeps back into the rivers. Indeed, the Productivity Commission identified this as an issue in 2006. As you increase the amount of water consumed on the irrigator's field, which is fine for the irrigator, that's good for the irrigator, that gets more bang for, for the irrigator's buck. And the downside is once you become more efficient at delivering water to your plants, it also means there's less water going back in terms of seepage into the aquifers, into the groundwater, and there's much less water going back off in terms of runoff. Quentin Grafton has called for accurate data on water use since the scheme was designed, but the irrigation industry and the government have tried to discredit his work. They just don't want to know. It's an inconvenient truth. We knock on the door, we tell them what we've done, we give them the evidence, and uh, we get pushback. So the pushback is, no, you're wrong. And so we say, well, that's fine. Maybe we are wrong. Tell us where we're wrong. Blank. And there's no response where we're wrong. It's a bit incredible to say this, we can spend $4,000 million to date and billions more to spend, yet we haven't done those measurements, those basic measurements, to allow us to know what, in fact, we've got net in terms of the impact for the environment. It was very well understood within the water agency, certainly at the Commonwealth level, that there was lots of question marks over the water efficiency program. Um, that it was always talked about with a raised eyebrow and a bit of a snigger, that there was um, a, lot of, uh, pro a lot of water that was bought at well, well above the going rate, a reasonable rate, um, and that the water savings were quite dubious. When Marianne Slattery was at the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, she discovered the infrastructure subsidies were funding the expansion of dams and sought data from the department director in charge of the scheme. That director told me that the Commonwealth didn't have that information and didn't keep that information. And I was pretty startled by that because I couldn't believe that a Commonwealth program that was worth billions of dollars would be administered that way. How surprised were you when you heard that? Oh, it was start absolutely gobsmacked. Marianne Slattery left the authority in disgust in 2017 concluding the Murray-Darling Basin plan was a fraud on Australian taxpayers and the claimed savings from the water infrastructure scheme were grossly exaggerated. Government does not do any checking of either at the first point the estimated saving or at the last point the actual saving, so there's no government checking in that process at all. How much confidence do you have in this system? None. No confidence at all. In my opinion, money spent on irrigation infrastructure programs is wasted. $4 billion of taxpayer money has been wasted to date. There is a huge opportunity cost of that money. It could have been spent on buying water directly back and reinvested within rural communities on services and activities that would actually help help them become more healthy and resilient. So in my mind, we've wasted $4 billion of taxpayer money. This year, the South Australian Royal Commission called for an overhaul of the $13 billion Murray-Darling Basin Plan. It described the $5.6 billion water infrastructure scheme as a quintessential example of a sorry lack of accountability and transparency. The Commissioner 
directly recommended that the whole scheme, first of all, be stopped because it probably doesn't work and it probably isn't recovering water and it is a huge expense to taxpayers. But the Auditor General should investigate the entire scheme. Who's um, been given the money? Why? And what is the scientific evidence, the scientific basis in relation to what amount of water is claimed to have been recovered from individual schemes or from the scheme overall? There's no transparency at all. The Australian Government blocked the Royal Commission from questioning Commonwealth employees and then ignored its findings. It was no surprise to the Australian economists, scientists and former officials who've warned successive governments about the water infrastructure scheme. The broader Australian public asked, demanded, that governments do something about the rivers of the Murray-Darling and essentially what we're seeing happen is that we're degrading the rivers at the same time as we're handing out money to a few individuals to realise huge economic um, gains at public cost. At this moment, with the set of political circumstances facing us and what I think is a willful lack of determination on the part of New South Wales, Victoria and now South Australia, aided and abetted by the Commonwealth Government, we are not going to see the Basin Plan properly implemented. We're not going to see the benefits flow to the environment that was intended way back in 2012. It's going to be a fundamental failure. And that's $13 billion of taxpayers' money compromised on the verge of failure, in my view, without some sort of real commitment from the states and the Commonwealth to do what they said they would do. The continuous response has been, well, just go away. Go away and just don't even talk about it. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going away. This isn't going away. It's not working. We could have taken the same amount of money, delivered for the environment, helped communities with hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in terms of various programs. Yet we chose not to do that. We chose to put it into pipes. We chose to put it into concrete. And we chose to deliver private benefits with public money. And that is a national scandal.